Politics and Prose Bookstore, and welcome to PMP Live this evening from DC's premier independent bookstore and cultural hub. Before we get to the main show, as it were, a few announcements. First, and most important, thank you for continuing to support us and by logging in tonight for what I know is going to be a killer conversation between Jonathan Katz and Mike Duncan. Do yourself a favor, do Jonathan a favor, do Mike a favor, and do us a huge favor by buying this side, <laughs> Gangsters of Capitalism from PMP Today. Um, it is, uh, we put it in the chat for you to buy. Uh, today's pub day, so it's hot off the press. And I have to say, I read it over the weekend and it is a page turner. Um, so please uh, make sure you order the book. Um, we can send it to you. If you're here in DC, you can come by the store and fetch it. And while you are on PMP's site, uh, definitely take a cruise around for some of our extra programs. I know you know us for books, but we do other things like a book a month club where we curate books for you or your friends that we can send to you once a month. Um, or the program that I do, the community sales program where we design and produce author talks uh, for private organizations and businesses and institutions. So we like to say at PMP, so many books, so little time. So last announcement for tonight, your mic is on mute, and, but we do want you to participate in the conversation by asking Mike and Jonathan questions. You can do that through the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, definitely put your questions in there so Mike can find them. And if there are lots of questions in there, you can upvote on what you wanna have asked since I assume this is gonna be a pretty dynamic conversation. We're also providing closed captions on demand um, and you can turn those on by clicking on the CC link, which is down at the bottom next to the Q&A link as well. So onto the show, um, for any history podcast listeners out there, tonight's moderator, Mike Duncan needs absolutely no introduction, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, he, he developed and hosted the amazing podcast series, History of Rome, and now is deep and well into the 11th season of the Spellbinding Podcast Revolutions, which goes deep, deep, deep into the nuances of key political revolutions in history and their continuing impact. He is also author of two New York Times bestsellers, The Storm Before the Storm and Hero of Two Worlds, The Marquis de Lafayette in the Age of Revolution. And as if that isn't enough, he was also a consultant for an episode of The Simpsons. But the real star tonight, however, is Jonathan Katz, again, with Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, the Marines, and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire, which, as I said, published today, hot off the press. Jonathan was the AP correspondent in Haiti and provided the first international alert of the deadliest earthquake um, ever recorded in the Western Hemisphere. He's also a regular contributor to the New York Times and a bunch of other publications, and he's, uh, you've probably seen him on TV and heard him on radio. And he formally directed the Media and Journalism Initiative at Duke University's John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. This is his second book. And let me tell you, it is a doozy. All right, Mike and Jonathan, go for it. Well, thank you very much for having us. Um, I am thrilled to be here uh, to help Jonathan launch his book, which is an amazing book uh, that I have been looking forward to for a long time. Uh, we are very happy to be here hosted by Politics and Pros uh, and very happy to hear the recent announcement that the workers uh, got their union recognized. We were very thrilled about that. There was a little like sort of, you know, touch and go moments there for, for about a week, week and a half, but we're very thrilled, uh, happy for the workers, uh, happy for politics and pros that we can continue to support books. And we're all just sort of in this to celebrate books and enjoy books. And we are here tonight to celebrate gangsters of capitalism. Uh, and so my own sort of entrepot to uh, Smedley Butler was when I was working on my, my revolution series on the Haitian revolution. And it ended with this sort of long, uh, history of Haiti from the end of the revolution through uh, basically through the earthquake is where I actually ended that episode. And there was a point at which I got, I was into 1915 and I was into the occupation by the Americans, which I was like, oh gosh, I never learned anything about this in school. And we got to the battle of Fort Riviere. And what I wrote was um, a small Marine detachment is I'm quoting now from episode 4.19. 
is a small Marine detachment led by Major Smedley Butler infiltrated the fort and took it without losing a single man. Unfortunately, I don't have time to wander off on a tangent about Smedley Butler, but if you are bored one day, Google Smedley Butler, and then I spelled it, S-M-E-D-L-E-Y-B-U-T-L-E-R. You can narrow down the search by including terms like war is a racket and gangster for capitalism. When you're done with that, move on to the business plot. Have fun. So this is, uh, I sent people off to go Googling for Smedley Butler, and there hasn't been like a book really about the guy that I think is modern or updated or reliable um, that connects today to back then, which is, I think, what has happened here. And I think what you've done, and I think now you're going to get to occupy this space. And we're re- so I'm thrilled about all this. And um, the historian Patrick Eber wrote a review of the book, a very, you know, very positive review of the book and said somewhat tongue in cheek that there, at this point in history, there are two groups of people who remember, remember Smedley Butler, and that's acolytes of Noam Chomsky or United States Marines. So do either of those describe you and how you discovered Smedley Butler? And if not, how did you come to discover him? And then like what drove you to write the book? Yeah. So first of all, Mike, thanks for being here. Uh, This is awesome. Uh, I I was sort of waiting for the revolutions music to start when you finished your your (laughs) intro about people going off and smelling spelling Smedley Butler. Um, Yes. Yeah, so I, I am, I am a, a, a part of a, a minority of a minority of people who have heard of Smedley Butler and did not come to him through either, <laughs> either of those channels. Um, I learned, I learned about him through Haiti. Um, mm-hmm. So as has been well trodden here, I lived in Haiti. I was based there for three and a half years, um, <clears throat> wrote my first book about Haiti. And it was actually, you know, it was, it was while I was in Haiti uh, and I you know, started learning about the U.S. occupation of Haiti you can't learn about the occupation without hearing Smedley Butler's name because he was so instrumental in, in both the initial invasion and then setting up that occupation. And then when I went to write my first book, I, you know, I, I told myself like, well, I'm, I'm not going to do like a chapter. I'm not going to make the second chapter of this book, the history of Haiti, because like the second chapter of every book about Haiti is about the history of Haiti. So as I was writing chapter two, the history of Haiti, um, I wanted to like go back and sort of expand a little bit on on the U.S. occupation because it's such an important moment in Haiti's history to explain how things had gotten so fragile that a magnitude 7.0 earthquake, you know, would end up being the deadliest earthquake in the history of the Western Hemisphere, and there was Smedley Butler, and it was then that I encountered these other Smedleys, um, the Smedley of War as a Racket. The Smedley of blowing the whistle on, you know, the the, the business plot, the, the the alleged fascist coup of, of 1934 um, against Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and at which point I started to realize that Butler had not been instrumental just in American imperialism in Haiti, but in American imperialism all over the world, and it, you know, it it, it planted a question in my mind that I had to sort of put aside as I was writing that book of like who the is this guy like how did how is how is the same person how is this person who was considered you know literally Haitians called him the devil how did how did the devil in Haiti become this sort of anti-war anti-imperialist hero to so many people in in America you know due to his activities later on how does one guy end up being the other and you know that question just stuck stuck with me and and it uh, it ended up animating me for the last seven years of my life as I was working on this book. Yeah. You've been working on this for like a really long time. Yes. I mean, people work on books for a long time, but <laughs> I'm one of them. And this was, yeah, yeah. this was a while. Yes, exactly. So, so the book though um, is really, it's two stories in one and you're constantly sort of bouncing back and forth between this conventional biography of Smedley Butler and then your own account of traveling to all of the different places that he went as he was, you know, off there being a gangster for capitalism, whether it's, mm-hmm. you know, China or Nicaragua, the Philippines, Panama, Haiti, uh, down in Veracruz, the Dominican Republic. So was it always your intention to, you know, t- tell those two stories simultaneously, like one as a journalist and one as a historian, um, or did that just grow organically out of it? Because one, I mean, one of the huge themes of the book is all of this stuff that he did a hundred years ago has this ongoing legacy today. So I'm just like curious, like writer to writer, what, I mean, what was sort of the, the book proposal going into it? Did it grow? Did it change? I mean, how did, how did we get to the final product here? 
this was, I, I mean, it was really my initial vision of the book. It didn't, it, it, it took a while to, to put together um, both, mm-hmm. both, both the traveling and the, and the writing of it um, and, or the traveling and, and the reporting of it, I should say. And then, you know, actually writing this into a way that I hope, I think it works. People, you say it works. People seem to think it works. Yeah, no, um, it, it, it worked, man. <laughs> okay. Very good. You're good. Um, but I, Actually, you know, there was some question at the beginning if we would be able to even sell a book as as complicated and as ambitious as the book that I was trying to do. There was some, you know, we were like, well, maybe maybe I really need to dial just directly into just, you know, a straight history, just, you know, maybe a straight biography of Smedley Butler. But it wasn't the book that I wanted to do. And there were a couple of reasons why I wanted to do a more you know complicated book besides the fact that I'm a glutton for punishment and I just like taking on very di- difficult tasks. Um, one thing was that, you know, I'm a journalist, uh, I'm, I'm a foreign correspondent. And, uh, you know, while I, I hope um, that, you know, I mean, I spent a long time in, in the archives, uh, you know, get, getting my hands dirty and, and traveling around the world and, and going to archives in different places. And I, and I hope that I've made some, you know, maybe some, you know, uh, historical interventions that, uh, uh, professional historians, including, by the way, my wife, who is, who's a professional historian, um, you know, would appreciate. But the thing that I knew that I could do that was different, special, um, is that, you know, I, I'm good on, you know, putting on my merrills and, and, you know, getting off an airplane and, you know, figuring out where I am and talking to people and, and you know, recounting the things that I see around me. So that was one reason. It was, you know, just a purely stylistic and and sort of you know competency uh, it's who you are uh, yeah. yeah exactly yeah. the other thing was that um i was telling a story here and i knew from from my time in haiti in particular that i was telling a story that americans did not know and that has in many ways been suppressed i mean just completely meta- memory hold in mm-hmm. the united states but is still remembered and passed down and you know celebrated um, uh, yelled about, you know, all, all these different things in other parts of the world. Um, and, you know, I talk about in, um, uh, in the prologue, uh, the, the great Haitian scholar, anthropologist, Michel Roth Trouillot, um, and, and, you know, he, he wrote and introduced this concept of, of you know, silencing the past. Um, and, and, he, and he talks about how, uh, in, in his book, Silencing the Past, um, he, he he talks about how you know uh, history is is silenced that, that when he says silence, uh, he means it as one silences a gun. And I wanted to go, you know, I wanted to go back to Haiti. I wanted to go to the Philippines. I wanted to go to China, to Nicaragua, you know, et cetera, and find the memory of these events. And 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 first of all, tell them from the perspective of the people who we invaded, um, and also look for parts that, you know, have been maybe completely left out of, you know, uh, American histories or English, uh, uh, you know, histories or English accounts of, of you know, these things that have happened. Um, and so, you know, it was, and, and then the last piece was that I wanted to, you know, I, I knew, I knew that the events in this book were going to be very relevant um, to the time that the book came out. I did not anticipate in 2016 um, how relevant they would be. I'm actually in, in some ways sad to say <laughs> that these events and, and you know, the rise of fascism in the 1930s in, in particular are more relevant than I had anticipated. Um, but I also you know, felt that it, I knew that there was going to be sort of this conversation between uh, the present and the past. And by the way, that was one of the things that made writing of it so difficult was that while the past you know, stayed the past, although there were different interpretations that one could play with and, and different things that, that I could discover, the present kept changing and the world in which this book was going to be released kept getting different and weirder and in some ways worse. And, and, and so that was, you know, that was a moving target that, that, uh, that I had to, to keep my eye on, you know, the entire time over the years as I was writing it. You can just say worse. You don't have to say somewhat worse or some in some way. Like you, we don't have to qualify. It's it's worse. Um, as, as we so, as we do as we do this event on Zoom, I I, I feel I like I, my my book is probably you know it's I, I don't know. I mean maybe there's some like kind of quick 
or books that came out earlier. But my book, I mean, like the, the coronavirus pandemic is in my book because it was going on while I was yeah. writing it. And for those of you who don't know how books work, like there's a long lag time. Like, you know, this book has been out of my hands for, you know, several months. Um, and, and, and the parts about the coronavirus, you know, I wrote them in, you know, 2020 and it's still happening. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a footnote in there about the assassination of, of, and like yeah. the footnote is like, we don't know who did it at the time of this writing. I'm going to be like, I'm going to pick this book back up in five years and I'm going to be like, Oh, we, yeah, we know who did it now. Like uh, yeah. all the facts came out. So I've, I've got, I was got an order here to these questions. Um, but everything you just talked about kind of, I'm going to skip to the end here. Um, cool which is that the book begins with this Haitian proverb. Uh, you know, this is sort of the epigram to, to, that opens up the book, which is the one who deals the blow forgets, the one who carries the scar remembers. Um, and we know this sort of from psychologists that, that bullies really don't remember the things that they did, whereas the victims really do remember. And if you take like, if you go to like a high school reunion, bullies will meet people that they bullied in high school and think actually that they were friends like, Oh, Hey, I know you, we had that class together. And the other person is like, yeah, I hated your guts. Um, but the bully has no sort of memory of that. And Americans have this notion that as we have gone forth into the wider world, we've sort of, we've done nothing but benevolent things. We've brought peace and democracy and Liberty. And, you know, we've helped other countries grow economically and we've invested in them and all these things. Um, so now you have been to all of these places, right? You've seen the legacy of these, these initial pin to American empire. So what is our legacy like out there? And I know that it's hard because pe you're an American and you're asking these questions and nobody's going to be as open with an American asking questions as they are just like kicking around their own kitchen, having conversations with each other about the Yankees. Um, but how like, so what is our legacy like out there? And then how can we go from being the one who dealt the blow, forgetting to being the one who dealt the blow remembering and then maybe not dealing so many blows like in the future. Yeah. Those are all, they're, they're great questions. Um, I think it's complex. Uh, it, it would be too simple to say that, uh, that, that Americans are always the villains, you know, in, in the places that, that we've invaded. Um, it's, it's a much more complicated relationship. Uh, there is, um, you know, there's dependency. There's, you know, some cases there's aspiration. I mean, I can you know, talk about Haiti where, where, where that saying, uh, you know, by coublier, pote marc change, like where, where that, I, where that idea of, of the epigraph comes from, um, you know, a lot of Haitians, you know, they, they, they deeply desire to come to America or they deeply desire, you know, American wealth um, or, or they, or they look, and, and this is something, you know, that I encountered in, in the history there's this, you know, uh, uh, you know, my mind immediately goes uh, to the Philippines, um, you know, when, when the Philippines, uh, so the United States is fighting its war against Spain in 1898. There are already wars of independence happening in Cuba and the Philippines that we sort of get involved in. We're fighting alongside the Filipinos against the Spanish and the Filipinos are looking to the Americans as this sort of, you know, great ally. Um, and, you know, Emilio Aguinaldo and uh, Apolinaro Mabini, like, the, like sort of, you know, the, the, these Filipino founding fathers, they're talking about America sort of doing for them what, you know, Lafayette, who, a, man, a man I know that, that you know something about, um, you know, did for the American Revolution. Um, and, you know, they're quoting, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson uh, and, and Jefferson's Declaration of Independence in their uh, uh, declaration. And, you know, they, they adopt uh, in their Declaration of Independence, they say they're adopting red, white and blue as their colors as a tribute to the United States and its help. Um, and then we turn around and betray them. Um, we, uh, we cut a side deal with, with Spain, stage a, a mock battle in Manila, um, and, and, and basically make a $20 million payment um, in you know, $1899 to uh, Spain in exchange for you know, the European, the white power recognizing our colonization of the Philippines. And you know, the Philippines, like Haiti, like a lot of these places, like it's really complicated. And it's something that I was trying to you know, get at, especially in, in, in the contemporary sections of the book. You know, there is there are lots of different memories of the United States in the Philippines. We are, we, we are a colonizer. 
Um, we, we, we destroyed their, their initial independence effort and colonized them uh, for half a century um, and only gave them their independence belatedly after bombing Manila to pieces um, in the name of liberating it in, in uh, the Second World War, which is something that, that people who were there then um, and, and, or, or grew up with people who were there then have a you know, very strong memory and very strong feelings about. Um, but there is also a feeling that, you know, the Japanese were worse <laughs> when, when, when the Japanese invaded the American colony, which, you know, so we were, we were, we were, we were part of what's, what sort of caused that war to happen because they were sort of, the, the Japanese were fighting against the Americans over control of these islands. But then when the Japanese took power, there's a memory of, you know, the Japanese being more murderous and more destructive and so, you know, not all, but some Filipinos look at the Americans at the end of that war as having been their liberators, although they would maybe have preferred that MacArthur just stopped before he like, you know, leveled Manila would have been nice. Um, and there, there are things like that everywhere. I mean, there are, you know, the, and, and, you know, this, this tension that runs through Smedley Butler's life um, and, and sort of runs through, you know, the, the, you know, that strain of the book um, between the United States as this bastion of democracy and this, you know, hope for equality um, in the world and the United States as this malevolent, uh, you know, imperial murderous force, which we've all, which we also are in the same way that those, you know, kind of run in conflict with one another and inform each other and, and fight against each other in a guy like Smedley Butler, those also inform the ways that, that people, you know, fight, or, you know, view, view the United States. And um, it's, 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 it's really complicated and, and you really have to, you know, you really have to dive in, uh, in, in depth to, to, to see, to see those contradictions and those complexities. Yeah. I mean, and Butler himself, yeah, is, is this insanely, you know, he's this complicated guy, um, because he's doing all of these things, but also sort of watching, it seems like he feels, it's like he's watching himself over his own shoulder, do things that he knows are quite cynical and quite wrong, but then he's just going ahead and doing it anyway. Yep. Um, and like, and then like in the thirties, when he he's telling, he's going around telling those funny stories about how they like rigged elections in Haiti. But at the same time, he's also like, the only thing I care about is saving democracy. And so he's this, he's this anti-fascist, like uh, uh demagogue practice, like by the end, he's really given these insane speeches, but at the same time, like perfectly willing to subvert democracy, you know, as long as it's uh, in the boss's interest. But so, so getting to Butler himself, like to his life, um, he, he starts as this teenager who idealistically joins the Marines to go fight in the Spanish American war, to go, to go liberate the poor beleaguered Cubans who are being held captive by the, you know, the Catholic Spanish tyrants, right. Which is, you know, all current at the time. Um, and then he goes through his whole career. And by the end, by the 1930s, by the time he's retired out of the Marine Corps, he's writing things like War is a Racket. And he is giving these incredibly, you know, very blunt and very cynical um, assessments of the American empire, very truthful, you know, but very blunt, very cynical. There's no idealism left. So how, how do we get from one to the other? Like, what were some of the key turning points that takes teenage, idealistic teenage Smedley Butler to like late middle-aged, very cynical Smedley Butler at the end of his life? Yeah. So, I mean, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. I, I like the way you talk about him sort of looking over his own shoulder. Um, I, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, he, so he, he's a, a Quaker. He grew up a Quaker on, on Philadelphia's main line. Um, and I think if, if there was one thing that that Quaker upbringing gave him, it was sort of a, a, a highly developed super ego um, to sort of look over himself and be, and be critical of himself. Um, but not, you know, not to the extent that he kept himself from doing the horrible things he, didn't, while he was he doing. Didn't reti- he didn't quit. No, no. Nope. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, that was one of the things that I was looking for. Right. Because that again, that was sort of the initial question that that animated me. How did this guy who, uh, you know, overthrew all these governments and, you know, dissolved a, a Haitian parliament at gunpoint and, and personally came up with the idea of reinstituting slavery in Haiti, a country 
famously founded in the only successful slave revolution, uh, up, you know, revolution by enslaved people against uh, a, a, a slaving power in France. Um, you know, Smedley Butler then comes in, you know, barely a hundred years after Haiti gets its independence, and is like, "Hey, slavery, let's 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 do that again to, to build roads for for the American occupation." I was looking for like, how does that guy then? you know, write these scathing articles. And he's, mm -hmm. he's known for, for his book, War is a Racket, but he, where he really gets into it are the, is the series of articles that he writes later in 1935 in a socialist magazine called Common Sense. And that's where he talks about, you know, I, was, I participated in the raping of, you know, half a dozen Central American republics. I made, you know, Tampico and Mexico safe for the oil companies. I made standard oil, uh, you know, made sure st standard oil got its way in China and all these other things. And I was looking for, like, is there one moment? And, you know, I, you, you start, I start seeing glimmers of it in his writings. And one of the things that was great about this project and, and that, that made it, you know, doable um, was that Butler uh, was a, just a, a prolific letter writer. He was just writing letters left and right uh, to his parents, uh, to his wife, Ethel Butler, um, uh, to, to his kids at one point, to other people. And, and so like at any given point, it's, he, he kind of like has almost like a social media feed throughout his life where he's just sort of like, you know, here, you know, I killed some people today and I have some thoughts about that and my tooth hurts and the food's terrible here. And it's like, it's, it's that level of, of detail. And, you know, you start seeing one of, one of the places that, it, that you start seeing this, new wave of thought kind of come in um, is in Nicaragua, which is, um, you know, one of the hot spots of what's known as dollar diplomacy, where long story short, the Taft administration um, decides that instead of, you know, fully colonizing a country as we and Smedley Butler had done in the Philippines at great loss of life and, and great expense uh, to sort of, you know, take over countries on the cheap, sending, you know, a small contingent of Marines to gain control and then gaining control over the economy of the country by, you know, taking over the central bank and, and taking over, you know, the customs houses. And it's in Nicaragua, this is uh, 1910, uh, 1912, that he's writing the, these letters. Um, you know, he's, you know, he, he's, He's, mo he's moved up into the flag staff. You know, he's become a major at this point. He's able to sort of make some more of his own decisions about where he goes and who he talks to. And in, and in moving around the country a little bit more freely and talking to people a little bit more according to his choice, he's starting to realize like, you know, we're not actually like supporting a democratic movement here. We're actually crushing a democratic movement. It seems like all the things that we're doing are not really for the benefit of, you know, even the United States or the American people or democracy. They, they seem to be, you know, for the benefit of Brown Brothers Bank um, and, and, and uh, J.W. Seligman and company. And he starts sort of writing, you know, these letters where he's, he's, he's starting to wrestle with that. And he's, and he's, you know, starting to say, you know, I don't, this is giving me a bad feeling, but it doesn't keep him from doing anything. And everything that he does in Haiti is after that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, re if, if, if you want to take the super cynical view, um, it's only at the end of his career in the you know, early 1930s, he, he, he retires in 1931. Um, you know, he, his, his last mission is in China. He's mm -hmm. been in China already during the Boxer Rebellion. He comes back in the late 1920s and he is there for the start of uh, the chinese civil war between the communists and the nationalists and this is these are during this is during the warlord period if if, if anybody's familiar with chinese history and um, you know at that moment he starts kind of becoming a little bit of a pacifist general he starts keeping his troops out of combat um, and, and, and taking steps to avoid a war. He sees this conflict brewing, especially between the Japanese who are there as allies of the Americans. In, you know, this is 1927, uh, uh, 1928. Um, uh, and, he, and he starts making moves in that direction. But to take the really cynical view, um, it's only after that when he basically realizes he's not going to become commandant of the Marine Corps, which was something that he still wanted, um, and that his career has kind of, you know, topped out 
that he really starts, you know, going on this speaking tour and letting his mouth run and scandalizing people by telling them, you know, what, what we've been doing overseas. And in seeing the reaction of these audiences where he's, you know, talking about the things that he had done in, in Nicaragua and Haiti and other places, um, then he starts, that starts kind of radicalizing him. And he's like, wait a minute. Like, I thought everybody, you know, at home was on board with this. And, uh, and then he gets court-martialed for insulting Benito Mussolini. And then he leaves the Marine Corps. And then he gets approached, you know, for the business plot. And it's really only after all of those things, you know, sort of after his ambitions in the Marine Corps have been mm -hmm. thwarted, after he's, you know, starting to go a little bit rogue, and after he realizes that the same people, the same, you know, bankers, the same politicians who wanted him to destroy and sent him to, and he did destroy democracies elsewhere, wanted him to do the same thing to his democracy, to our democracy in the United States. Um, you know, that is kind of what, what radicalizes him. Also the bonus March, there's a lot here, but, the, but you know, that, that's kind yeah, of, it's, what, it's a lot. Everybody should buy the book and read the book. Yeah. Right. But, but, but it's, that's kind of, that's kind of what sets him on, on his radical path. And then he basically spends the 1930s, which, if, if you have to pick a, a, a decade in American history to become a radical, basically the 1930s are number one, the 1960s are number two. So like it was the right time for it. That that's kind of what set him sets. Him yeah, but, but yeah, but it is wild that like, you know, he, you know, he's going to, he's going to write war as a racket, but he's also like everything that he has done in his life leads the people who are, who are going to stage, or maybe they staged this business plot. Maybe they were trying to get it going like that. They would still have identified, Smedley Butler as maybe the guy who should be leading this, yeah. right? When it's like, really, they should have gone and talked to MacArthur, right? It seems like they should have talked to MacArthur first, and maybe Butler second. Um, but yeah, that that maybe this turn didn't come until until such a such a late stage, as you say. I think I started to pick up on that because, like, I was very late in the book before, um, you know, before he really starts to start to say all these things. And certainly, there were people in the business community who still thought that he was uh, was up for being a, a, a racketeer and being hired muscle some more for another. Um... Yeah. From, 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 from a writing standpoint, one of the things that I, you know, had to deal with is that, you know, it's, you don't want the main character in your book and this is nonfiction, but I think we can talk about it in terms of characters. You don't want the, the main character in your book to be so unlikable that the, that the reader, you know, loses interest and, mm -hmm. and, and doesn't want to continue on the story. And, you know, Butler, you know, Butler's a hero to a lot of people. And, you know, and, and, and I, I, I would, I include myself in, in, I'm definitely like a major member of like the Smedley Butler as anti-hero fan club. Sure. Um, and I believe he, actually, he's in that, he's in that magnificent bastard kind of, Exactly. Uh, kind of TV trope. Yeah, exactly. And, and I believe, by the way, um, I, I shared uh, I, I shared the link to this event um, with with uh, one of Butler's granddaughters, uh, Philippa Wheelie, who who um, I, I spent time talking to the book. So if she's out there, I'm sure she would. She's probably nodding along because she understands exactly what I'm talking about. But it's only it's, the, the, you know, the things to really love about Smedley Butler um, are really the things that that really come out most at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. And because I was going to be spending so much real estate in this book, talking about the American empire and talking about just the atrocious things that, you know, the massacre at Fort Riviera, as you were talking about at the beginning, um, you know, I really was like, you know, how am I, like, I kind of had to sort of dribble in a little bit of, of you know, sometimes heavy handed foreshadowing and sometimes just direct quotes from the end of his life you know, with, with sort of, you know, temporal markers where I'm sort of, you know, looking back, Smedley Butler would say just to be like, he know like he will eventually know that well, what he is doing here is bad. <laughs> um, please, 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 please stay tuned. But this is, I mean, but it was also a thing that I was struggling with, like a lot of the time, you know, like, you know, I, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm going through this history. I'm understanding the things that he did. I'm, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm reading his, his, his writing from the field about it, his letters, and I'm just like, Smed, what are you, what are you doing? You know better than this. You like you're a Quaker. Like, what the hell? Um, and and yeah, I mean, it's it's uh it's eye-opening, but it also is something that you know I 
identified with a lot as as a as an American, um, as you know, as somebody you know, I was never a Marine. Um, I was never in the military. I was I was a a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press, um, which sometimes likes to self style itself as the Marine Corps of Journalism, um, largely because the the way the bosses tell it, it's because. Uh, AP right, uh, uh, reporters are, are, you know, the first ones in and the last ones out. Um, uh, the, the, you know, as, as an a AP grunt from the field can tell you, it's because uh, much like the Marine Corps, you can't spell cheap without AP. Um, <laughs> you're sort of, you're sort of put in situations and like, you're just given like non-working equipment and you're just sort of like, good luck. <laughs> you were, you were a racketeer for the wire press <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. And I was like, I was the representative of yeah. this, like, big imperial and imperious yeah. you know force where oftentimes i was the only american if not and maybe the only white guy um in in a, in a in a situation and um you know I, like I, look i never massacred anyone um but oh, that's you know good I, here, um, I, I i can say that i could i could say that without 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 fear of penalty and perjury <laughs> but you know but i did things that you know looking back you know, I'm like, oh, that wasn't great. Or, you know, maybe I was, maybe I was spending too much time, you know, uh, you know, doing, you know, following my orders, uh, you know, from my bosses, um, which were ultimately, you know, to, to, to benefit AP's bottom line or, 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 you know, or, or, or the bottom line of the place that I was writing for at any given moment than the people who are around me. And so that was something that I could identify with him. And I think, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, especially in our nation's capital, um, can probably think of moments in their past where they've also, you know, just been following orders. Um, and, and, and it was only later that they looked back and were like, oh, I really could have, I really could have made better choices. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this leads right into my next question, which is also plays into like, um, him watching himself and sort of knowing what he was doing wasn't necessarily the most honorable thing is that, I mean, you open up his Wikipedia page or you, you know anything about Smedley Butler and one of the first things in the first sentence is always going to be two-time Medal of Honor winner. Like he's, he's one of the few people who's ever won a Medal of Honor. I haven't been in the military either. You know, when I hear Medal of Honor, I think, you know, like rescuing an entire boatload of people by single handedly, you know, like fighting Nazis, you know, with a machete and, you know, or you jumped on a grenade and saved a bunch of people's lives. So he, he is this like legendarily decorated soldier. And um, but his two Medals of Honor, when you actually get into the details of why he won these Medals of Honor, there were things that he did in battle. There were battlefield heroics. Um, you know, he, he was, he was pulling wounded men out of the field. I think that that trip across the bay to feed his starving men, which, you know, they probably should have just, you know, cracked some bananas, uh, not done that. But, um, uh, so just give us a really brief nutshell. Like why did he win his, each of his two medals of honor? And then what did he think about the fact that he won medals of honor for what he did? Yeah, those, those are really good questions. So I think th the thing that he did that people who have been in the military recently, would recognize as being sort of the most medal of honor worthy moment was the thing that he didn't get a medal of honor for. It was during the, the boxer rebellion. Yeah. Um, as you know, like he, he, pro he pulls this private Carter out from behind enemy lines. He's got a, you know, a compound fracture in his leg. Um, you know, he's under fire and then he, you know, he, 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 you know, spends whatever it was four hours, you know, carrying uh, Carter back to camp. Um, everybody else who was involved in that action got the Medal of Honor. He didn't because in 1900, officers weren't eligible for uh, Medals of Honor. And oh, fun fact, um, uh, you know, which which becomes obvious in the book, Butler he joined the Marines at 16 as an officer, largely because his father was a prominent congressman and he was rich. And that was the thing that you could do in 1898. Um, so he joins as a, a second lieutenant. So he's actually never enlisted. He's, he's an officer throughout. And a lot of what he's doing, honestly, is to try to prove to, to, you know, his fellow Marines that, that he's worthy to be there with them, that he's not, you know, just, just a daddy's boy, even though he is. Um, and so the two things that he does to actually get the medals of honor that he gets. Um, the second one is the battle of Fort Rivier in Haiti, the thing that you were talking about. Um, and, you know, there is some, uh, you know, there are some heroics, if, you know, if you define heroics as, you know, doing a thing that risks your life um, for the mission. 
um, you know, he, he, he basically forces himself through essentially like a, like a, it's not a pipe, but like a, like a, a drain crevice um, in the fort. First of all, he, he hikes up uh, this, this mountain um, about 3000 feet. And I can tell you from having made it most of the way up, cause I didn't even make it all the way. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's, that that was a schlep like that 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 was a, a, an impressive trek on its own um and then you know he then forces himself you know through this 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 crevice and pops up in the middle of this fort surrounded by insurgents um so you know it was it was his leadership during that battle and that action that got him the second medal of honor that is like you know maybe I don't know. I don't know how 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 you know people Marines of of you know the 21st century would feel about getting a Medal of Honor for that. The first Medal of Honor, he tried to give back. He was like, "This is bull," because uh, that was during the invasion of Veracruz um, in in 1914, um, and that is an an episode uh, which uh, 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 Mexicans, you know, Mexican historians rightly you know likened to the iraq war um it was done directly at the behest of the oil companies in the united states um the uh um uh, uh the the lawyer for the oil companies who actually calls on the u.s to invade mexico is a guy named william f buckley senior um whose son obviously you may know from from his founding of the national review and other assorted things um, including his opposition to the uh, federal holiday that just passed on Monday. Um, and Butler is, you know, part of this, you know, uh, invasion uh, that comes ashore. And at that point, at the po- so this is during uh, an episode, Mike, that I know you also know very well, um, uh, the Mexican Revolution. Uh, and I don't, I don't remember the, the episode n- number, uh, but, but you Neither do I. <laughs> but you do you do a great uh, episode about the invasion of Veracruz, um, and guns and of Veracruz as, man won the war. Yep. After the and, Americans gave Obregón the guns from Veracruz, Pancho Villa never won another battle. That's it, a hundred percent. And and uh, by the time the you know when the Americans come ashore at Veracruz, um, you know the 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 federales the 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 federal troops under. Uh, Victoriano Huerta have already sort of, they've been pulled back from Veracruz because they know the Americans are going to come with overwhelming force. And Carranza, his revolutionaries, um, don't, uh, they, they, they've they also not yet reached Veracruz. They're, they're sort of engaged in Tampico, a, far, a little bit farther up the coast. So by the time the Americans come ashore, they're fighting essentially civilians, um, you know, old men, women, children, with guns who are just, you know, trying to like, you know, d- defend their, their home against this invasion force. Um, and, you know, it's, it's horrific fighting. It's house to house fighting. As I talk about in the book, it's in a lot of ways, the thing that Butler does that is sort of the, the, you know, the most uh, uh, direct antecedent to uh, way in, in 68 in Vietnam, Fallujah in, in, in Iraq in 04. Um, it's that kind of like house to house fighting that later becomes, you know, a staple of what Marines do, you know, so like it take, it took bravery in the sense of like, it took taking his life in his hands, but it, you know, they weren't going to lose that battle. Like they were fighting against children in, in many cases. Um, literally, I mean, the, the, the defense of the, the, um, the, the Mexican Naval Academy is, is by cadets. Um, I, you know, and I, I, and I talk about it in the book from, from the perspective of um, Pepe Azueta, who's, who's sort of one of, one of the, the Mexican heroes, who's, you know, a kid, he's a, a teenager who's, who's, who's fighting against the, the Americans as they come ashore. So, you know, he tried to give that Medal of Honor back and uh, Josephus Daniels, uh, the white supremacist secretary of the Navy, um, who uh, was there under Wilson at the time, you know, tells him like, shut up, Butler, like you, you we're, we're, we're trying to we're trying to like score some propaganda points here. Uh, we're trying to convince everybody that this was a really big deal battle. And so we've awarded more medals for this battle than any other battle before or since in American history. So you 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 will take your Medal of Honor and you will like it. Um, but yeah, I mean, even Butler at that point and, and, you know, and that, uh, you know, I, I talk in the book about, um, moral injury 
And that's that's a moment where and, and actually, you know, he, he finds out that he got the Medal of Honor um, for Veracruz after the Battle of Fort Rivier. Um, and, and so these things are happening, you know, in, in, at the same moment for him. And he is and he's weighing this and he's thinking about this and he's having some feelings about it. But again, it's not enough for him to it's not enough for him to stop. Right. OK, so I have I have one more question and then I'm going to turn to listener questions. Right. Um, so we got we got about we got about 13, 14 minutes. But I want I want to get to this because there was one bit that I had never heard anything about, which is this time, this like two years that he spent as director of public safety in Philadelphia, where he had he was brought in to help police the city. They specifically requested a military man because like prohibition was out of control. I mean, this is sort of like the, you know, the prohibition gangster period. And when he comes in, you know, he brings with him these things that he has learned from running overseas colonies, right? The, all these things that he had done in Haiti. And you make this point that like, I mean, we, we've had all these conversations now about policing and the origins of policing in the United States. And we know that a lot of it comes from, or it comes from slave patrols in the South, but also like the London constabulary, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, like they start developing themselves in the 1820s and 1830s based off of their own experiences trying to control and contain the Irish, right, in Ireland. So I was just really, really interested in this connection, but this very, very early connection, because we talk about the militarization of the police as this very recent phenomenon. And then you're like, well, actually, you know, it sort of comes out of these, these militia units that were being used to run colonial wars. So how does and what does Butler do to import the things that he has learned from running America's empire into Philadelphia? And then like, what was the impact of all of this? Yeah. So one of, so one of the things, this is also like, a, like a behind the scenes writer thing. One of the things that I told myself when I started to write this book, I was like, well, this is not going to be a, a biography of Smedley Butler. It, you know, it's, it's a larger story than that. And one of the ways in which I was telling myself that I wasn't going to you know cover every part of his life is like, well, I'm not going to write about like this, like that, the, the d- d- director of the department of public safety of Philadelphia thing. And then, um, you know, so I'm, um, I'm moving my way through this book and it's 2020 and uh, the George Floyd uprising happens. And I like look around and I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> I guess I'm talking it's about- actually extraordinarily relevant. <laughs> I guess it's actually gonna happen. Um, and yes, yeah, so Butler, um, he takes off, uh, he, he gets a leave of absence from the Marine Corps. Um, well, you know, a, a, a thing about Smedley Butler that I think really comes through when you, when you study his life was the man was addicted to action. I mean, if he, if he, if he wasn't in the shit, like if he, wa- if he wasn't getting shot at um, and, 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 you know, and, sh- and shooting back, you know, he, he, to a certain extent, he felt like, you know, he, he wasn't really alive. And even when he, you know, enters his anti-war phase, he's at least, you know, sort of putting himself and his reputation on the line constantly. And when he gets to, and so, you know, you know, it's, it's the 1920s, there, there aren't any, you know, major, uh, the, the U.S. occupation of Haiti is still happening and of Nicaragua, um, but, you know, he, he's not getting sent to, to those. And so he's looking for action. So he goes to Philly, to his hometown, and he brings Marine Corps tactics. Um, you know, he, uh, you know, he sets up, you know, command posts around the city. Um, he sets up like kind of like modified, like artillery, like police cars with like a rotating limber in the back where like you can get like a gunman so they can be like shooting at the gangsters as they're like going past them. And the other thing that he's doing, in addition to all these, is also, you know, introducing, you know, sort of, you know, more Marine Corps style ranks and things like this. The other thing that he's doing is he is he is bringing with him the marine attitude toward the world and he is talking about the racketeers of philadelphia in the same language and with the same intensity that he was talking about um uh insurgents in the places that he was fighting in in all of those places we talked about them as being bandits and in the same vein he's you know he's talking about He's talking about these, you know, Al Capone aligned uh, Philadelphia gangsters like Mickey Duffy and Max Boo Boo Hoff as bandits. And he's, you know, tell he's, you know, he's saying to uh, the guys in the Philadelphia PD, he's like, you know, you, you know, I don't see enough, uh, uh, you know, bandit notches on your guns, like go out and get some. And the thing that's interesting about that, especially from the perspective of 2020, 2022, is that you know, the leading gangsters 
are, you know, uh, a lot of them are immigrants from Europe um, or children of immigrants from Europe, uh, you know, Jewish Americans, Italian, uh, Irish. Um, but the people who are actually targeted by Butler's officers, almost by default, I mean, I, I don't see like any evidence that like Butler ordered this, are Black people. And that, you know, to a certain extent, like his, I mean, to almost a complete extent, you know, his time in Philadelphia is, is, you know, a, a complete failure. Um, but uh, to, to a certain extent, it's, it was because they were going after the wrong people. And so you see in, you know, 1926, the militarization of the Philadelphia police being used in this expressly anti-black and and uh, expressly white supremacist way and as a postscript i will note that one of the officers who serves under uh smedley butler is a guy named uh ralph rizzo um whose son frank rizzo uh, mm -hmm. becomes one of the most notorious white supremacist um uh you know, police chiefs and then mayors of the city of Philadelphia. And during the George Floyd uprising, a lot of the protests in Philly, one of the most, uh, uh, you know, colorful protests in Philly during uh, the summer of 2020 was, were, were uh, you know, protesters with Black Lives Matter trying to, to take down the statue of, of Frank Rizzo, which ended up getting removed. All right. Um, so we've got, let's see, we got about seven or eight minutes. Um, so I've got some listener questions here. Um, one of them. And so let's just like run through these. So North asks, why do you think FDR declined to prosecute the plotters of the business plot? Um, how serious and widespread was the plot? And like, why didn't there seem to be any real follow-up? That's a great question. Um, I mean, you know, the short answer is we don't know, because at least as far as I can, I mean, you know, as, as far as my research went, I never found, you know, a letter from FDR, you know, or, or a diary entry it was like, you know, business plot today, not going to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. um, and here's why, Jonathan. Um, uh, but, you know, I can sort of, you know, make some educated guesses. Um, first of all, uh, it is not clear it largely because there was not a larger investigation done, how deep and how extensive the planning for the business plot was. Um, I think we can say with, with near certainty that the specific bond salesman who tried to uh, recruit Smedley Butler for this plot. Um, and, you know, if you need to, like, it's, it's in the book, what's happening here, book. but yeah. So um, uh, that guy definitely, thought that he was the front man for a conspiracy. Um, he talked like he was, he went on a tour of, you know, fascist Europe and was sending Butler um, uh, postcards about it. And the reason why we know all of that is true is because he was one of the only people besides Butler who came and testified under oath um, in front of the house committee, the, the, the house uh, committee on un-American activities actually. Um, and, you know, he perjured himself. He lied about a lot of things, but like even in his perjurious, like, you know, weird contradictory testimony, he is corroborating so much of what Butler is saying that we know that we, you know, we can say pretty certainly that this guy was involved and that he tried to recruit Butler and his boss was a financier named Grayson MP Murphy, who, you know, this is in the book. But based on Murphy's background in both military intelligence and the financial sector um, and his, his ties to some of the other people who are Butler is alleging, uh, you know, some of the big names like the DuPonts and Alfred P. Sloan of General Motors, that they were behind it. You know, Murphy was almost definitely part of it. Beyond that, it becomes harder to say because there wasn't a larger investigation. I think that to a certain extent, FDR may have reasoned that, and, and uh, John W. McCormack, who ends up becoming Speaker of the House and is the head of the committee that Butler uh, testifies in front of, they may have reasoned that merely coming forward and blowing the whistle on this may have done enough to sort of dissuade the, uh, the business plotters, however many there were, uh, from going forward with their plan. 
FDR, you know, may have not wanted to embarrass other, you know, friends of his, members of his class. Um, I, I, I'm certain that that was probably part of the reason why, you know, major media like Time Magazine, the New York Times, um, you know, were, were casting so much doubt and so many aspersions on Butler's testimony, even though they, they gave it sort of major play, but they were also lampooning it. I'm sure that that was part of the reason why they didn't want to investigate further. But for FDR's part, his decision, um, and, you know, in retrospect, this seems to have worked out, was to sort of convince Americans of uh, that, you know, liberal democracy could still work for them by sort of incorporating bits of socialism and social democracy in the New Deal and, and you know, helping people weather the Great Depression. And so, you know, you know, who knows, maybe, you know, that was the decision that he made. It could have gone a lot of different ways. Um, but those are the best guesses that I have. But I can tell you that, you know, throughout 1935, 1936, um, Butler spends a lot of his time basically in a flame war with, with the congressmen who were the head of this committee, sort of, you know, doing dueling radio speeches where they're sort of denouncing each other and, and, he, and he's accusing them of having been complicit in the plot, which, which, does, not, <laughs> which does not end up uh, winning him any, any favors uh, or any, 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 uh, any friends over the rest of his life. All right. So I'm going to try to sneak in one more here, um, which is from Matthew. And it's uh, as a black American and son of a Marine, this history weighs heavy on many black Americans as both enslaved, but accessories to imperialist wars abroad. How can we understand the imperial mission of the United States Marine Corps in Haiti and its relation to American apartheid? Good luck. Thank you. Um, so the, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, Briefly, like these are things that, that, that I tried to tackle in the book. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the influence of white supremacy and American apartheid on these people and on these actions is everywhere. Um, it doesn't, that is not to say that there aren't black soldiers who are involved in some of these instances. Um, there are, there, uh, they're only involved where the army and the Navy are involved because black soldiers, non-white soldiers, uh, non-white Marines uh, did not exist until 1942, until, until, until the second world war, um, which also then makes the Marine Corps an especially fervent mm -hmm. bastion mm -hmm. of white supremacy, even within the, 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 the armed forces. Um, so, you know, there are no black Marines in Haiti because there are no black Marines during the U S occupation of Haiti, but there are black soldiers in Cuba. Um, there are black soldiers in uh, the Philippines. Their their perspectives on what's going on is interesting, right? Because, you know, they do have these. I wouldn't even call them. I, I would just say, like, you know, it's another point of view because they're they're looking at they're looking at the the you know super racist white soldiers, you know, throwing around the N word, including against you know Filipinos. Um, and saying like, you know, you know, we wouldn't have these problems if, if we had treated these people as people from the beginning, but then at the same time, they're also helping extend empire. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the fingerprints of this are everywhere, you know, the, the Marines and the Americans sort of introduced Jim Crow to the Panama Canal Zone. We introduced Jim Crow to Haiti. Um, it, th that, that's another ugly part of this history. And then we end up, you know, re-importing this, you know, in Butler's case to American police. And then, and then, uh, you know, uh, with this, you know, uh, uh, possible attempted and, and, and uh, fomented rise of fascism in the 1930s. And, you know, to somebody who, you know, like, like the questioner, um, you know, has been in the mil in, in the military recently um, and, or, or has family who has, um, you know, I think that there's there there will be a lot in this book and a lot in this story um, that you know they could relate to, uh, because um, you know in in the same way that you know people who uh, you know have experienced racism in the United States and then they've gone to Iraq, they've gone to Afghanistan, they've gone to Libya, um, and they've seen the ways that other forms of American racism. Um, uh, you know, are, are are then used against these people over there, and then the ways in which that 
uh, you know, comes back home in, as, you know, Kathleen Ballou writes, um, you know, in the form of, you know, increased uh, uh, fervency of the white power movement and, and you know, all of these ways in which, in, in which you know, impunity abroad uh, creates impunity at home. It's a lot to wrestle with. And, and you know, I, 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 you know it's, it's, it's something that, and, and, and I think that, you know, Butler, you know, um, you know, Butler for Butler, you know, white supremacy and 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 his relationship with racism. I'll leave it at this: are sort of blind spots in in his life. He has a more complicated relationship with it than some of his fellow Marines, but but not much. Um, but in the same way that that he's wrestling with these contradictions, you know, I mean, that's these are contradictions that all of us wrestle with as Americans, um, you know, or you know, all of us wrestle with as people. And, and it's, it's, it's what I think, you know, makes this, uh, you know, as, as urgent a story and, and as, uh, as an interesting a story as it is. Well, yeah, I think uh, we're moving towards the end of this thing. Um, are, are we going to, are we going to get hooked off the stage? I thought somebody was going to come on and hook us off the stage. Chatting. I would, you know, knock yourself out. No, um, well, I think we should just, we should wrap this up. And I just want to say thank you very much, Jonathan, for writing this book. Uh, I now have the one thing that I get to point everybody to and say, like, if you want to learn more about because Butler is fascinating, but also just like this period is fascinating. And we just we always skip. We always just go civil war. And then, look, we became sort of a big deal in World War One and then World War Two. And we just we just skip all this stuff. And, you know, the people who dealt the blow forget and the people who receive the blow remember and i think that is the overarching theme of the book so just thank you very much thank you yeah thank you to both of you as i was saying i i read the book over the weekend and i feel like i know a little bit more about the spanish-american war which i never really learned about in school so thank you um uh, yeah, please get the book. Um, we have the link in the chat. Um, this was an amazing, amazing conversation and it's really only the tip of the iceberg. Um, Smedley Butler, as far as I can tell, is really like Zelig of uh, American history. So um, thank you again, Mike. Thank you again, Jonathan. Happy publishing day. And um, 